Cool. Okay, so it's all from back to the podcast. It's been long since we are you know, uploading this. So on this podcast, we have Varun Dugirala. Without any further ado, let's jump right into it. Hi guys. So before we begin, like I have this thing on the podcast where I do not do intros. Firstly, because mm. the person I'm introducing will introduce themselves better. And other than mm. that, I'm, I'm partly I'm bad at introductions. So for the people who don't know, who is Varun Dugirala? What does he do? What is, who is Varun Dugirala? So, um... quick uh, flashback i am a creative entrepreneur i i started a company called the glitch way back in 2009 um after quitting music television uh two person apartment startup which became one of india's largest uh, creative agencies so we about 5 700 people now um across a couple of bunch of cities in india uh, we part of a global network we got acquired in 2018 by uh, wpp the global ad network um i also am a a uh, small town boy who started who did an extended stint of doing engineering and then eventually landed up in the media space and then obviously started the glitch um 2018 onwards i've started doing a podcast called advertising is dead where i talk about how the whole space of advertising media marketing and business is changing I've been doing that for about 175 episodes now i also host two more podcasts one's called take a pause where i share my learnings on developing the right mindset um dealing with motivation um and uh, just performing better in life and think fast which is basically a weekly round up me and suchita who's the co-founder and ceo at lbb we talk about everything that's happening in business that week um i also post random videos on instagram have tried to do youtube in recent times i have a four and a half year old daughter and two shitsus interesting awesome so the first question begins like why so many podcasts what is it about post- podcasts that appeals you so much right so i have I, i have a couple of insights as well because i have been doing podcasting since 2 years not that many mm. episodes sadly but still like a tad bit of experience so why mm. podcasts kya usme what do you like about it so much um so i wasn't a podcast listener before becoming a podcaster um i went on uh, as a guest on someone else's podcast pilot and one thing led to another and i was asked if i want to host my own um and i ended up i'm this person who landed up in the ad in- industry without ever working in the advertising industry mm-hmm. so i always w- wanted to know how things work in a broader space because i came from content i came from production um so that's how advertising is did happen i just okay let's try it out let's see how fun it is but um i feel the good part with podcasts is, is that a it's really deep and and i would say um all encompassing conversations right i think with video we tend to compress things a lot more we tend mm-hmm. to cut things up a lot more in audio you can actually let it free flow and it has a certain connection with the audience which i think video still doesn't get as much unless it's a video podcast which is again whole mm-hmm. different animal to itself for sure um why do minis not all content fits into the same podcast um very early on i mean i think about 100 plus episodes of advertising is dead i realized that i wanted to talk about more things beyond business which is when like what was then called the varun dugi show and now called take a pause started and uh, think fast literally happened almost as a random thing cuz suchita and i both talk about what's happening in the business space over weekend calls and we said can we just take a call we do every second week and make it a podcast and that's how it happened we just we both like to have our own take on what's happening in the world of business and uh, we just thought the best way to do it was to do a podcast so I think it's you need to find the right property um and it see if it fits into what you're already doing or does it have to be a different show uh, that's the reason why I do it it's deeper involvement audience is a lot more engaged and um, it's not as complicated to do compared to video interesting so do you think it's like a performance you put up and different different personalities you show in all the different podcasts you do or is it the same person mm-hmm. saying the same things on three different podcasts with differing context so I think I'm largely the same person. Um the only thing is I think my tonality changes a little bit. Um so mm-hmm. like take a pause for instance, right? I'm talking about mindset development, I'm talking about you know uh, everything from like self doubt to confidence to you know mindset building. So my pace of speaking is a lot slower because it's meant to be almost meditative when you listen to it, right? Mm-hmm. So I pace myself that way. but of both of the others i'm pretty much the same tone of voice um so in general my voice doesn't change i think maybe the tonality basis how we want the experience to be will evolve but um, i think the person i am is the person i am and i bring uh, that to the table and um say so that's how i look at it because like almost in any other form of content like except podcast it's always a performance someone is putting up right and and, mm-hmm. and and it is required but i think in podcast it's not so for me it's like podcasting is just like a playing field i'm just i have nothing to lose here right i'm just a student just asking mm-hmm. random questions to whoever i like yeah. and it's 
I mean, it's just me. I I don't do any prep for the podcast. I just mm. have a couple of questions and pointers here and there if I become blank. But other than that, it's just just me. So the next question for that is so it is a long form content, right? So it's very difficult mm. to sort of make sure you're always always making sense because for for like an hour, I'm it's mm. difficult for everybody to make sense for an hour, right? So how yeah. how, how, how yeah. do you develop that? How to make sense for an entire hour? Um, so it's easier to make sense for an hour if it's two people, um, because all you're sitting down and doing is having a conversation, right? Um, mm. So I start with a few things. I know how I want to start every conversation, and I want know how I want to end it. Um, and in between is what you need to figure out. And I basically put down pointers that I want to cover through that conversation. I never write down questions. Um, I write down pointers. Okay, like I'll give you an example. Um, mm-hmm. I have an episode coming out very soon uh, where I recorded with uh, Siddharth Warrior, right? Um, who does neuroscience content, yeah. etc. I'm like, okay, I know I want to ask Sid about the science of motivation. I know I want to ask him about our how food connects to our brain because I know that's something he's on a fasting uh, focus in recent times. So I'll pick a few things like that, make a list, and then I, while you, I know my first question and I know my my last question. Hmm. In between basis, how his responses are is what I find. So I think oftentimes the way to have a long winding one hour, two hour, uh, three hour conversation is to have enough points in front of you, and to listen enough to the other person that you will actually find your next question in what uh, the other person said. Hmm. Um, like I've been on an Amit Verma podcast where he on his podcast where I think our conversation was three hours. Wow. That we spoke for three hours, and uh, we actually I, only podcast recording ever in my life where I had to take a loop break in between recording. Um, but over there, I, I could see that he had research on one side. He had pointers on the other. So um, it helps to have those. Sometimes you don't even need them. You just go with the flow. Mm-hmm. But just have a list of things saying, okay, these are points I know I need to cover or I want to ask about. Um, it's a good backup to have, and and that's how you do it. So you, you header and footer, and um, also don't go on for too long about one topic. Hmm. I think the Indian audience, by my calculations, this is totally my metric on my content, is that um, eight minutes, seven to eight minutes is a threshold Indian audiences have on one topic. Interesting. So if you want to go longer on that topic, you switch to something else and bring it back to it. Um, otherwise, your retention drops. And uh, that's me basically looking at my data and learning that part and trying it out and seeing that the retention improved. So that's been my learning from my content. Um, but I think it it will differ from podcaster to podcaster. Okay, so let's talk about that, right? Let's say someone wants mm. to put a lot of nuance in the conversation. Let's say let's say you're talking about neuroscience, and yeah. you already have like uh, a good enough use, uh, like good enough listener base. So how do you make yeah. sure that the content is consumable enough for that many mm. number of people? Because if you be, if if it's too much of nuance, people will just drop off, right? So how do you maintain yeah. that? How do you maintain that sort of quality, but also make it consumable for everybody? You need to um, a start off with saying, okay, am I covering the basics? What if somebody doesn't know anything about neuroscience? Are my other things I'm asking going to cover that without seeming like that's the only thing? So hmm. it's that whole scaling up of okay, let's say I've asked, let's go back to what I said, right? science of motivation. Start off with um, talking about how does our mind work when we are when we find motivation, right? Uh, you start off with that. So he, he, you know, you speak about that. Then basis is responsive. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Till a point, and this happens over time of doing podcasts, is you realize, okay, I think I've gone far enough on this one, hmm. and I need to move to something else. Um, do you get that intuition? But I feel what also helps is a constant look at the data. So what I actually do is all pod, all podcasting platforms give you that retention graph. Hmm. So I kind of go and see where the drop offs are happening, and you go to that point in the episode and see what happened there. Like what did we say at that point? It's like twenty percent of people just dropped off. And you over time use that to train your mind to look at it. Um, now I have it's almost like a mental clock for me. Like I know when I need to have a break. I know when I need to shift a topic. Um, but I think I still go back to the um, the retention graph so often because I learn so much from it. Right? It's I mean data can't lie. Mm-hmm. Um, it teaches you things, and just using that in that sense. But I, I feel uh, also from the nuance point of view, it's an interesting question you asked. Um, is that I feel people want nuance. Mm-hmm. What they don't want is for you to get into the same point again, and again, and again. Hmm. So whenever you feel it's repetitive, let's say you and I talk about something, right? If it's getting repetitive, that's a good time to switch topics um, because because you 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 don't have anything more to go to. 
so you end up just doing the same thing again and again hmm. um but and, and and that's another way to kind of gauge if you need to switch topics yeah and, and a really interesting example of that is how tanmay uh, did the hmm. show with said right like when i, I think yeah. a year or two back when they did neuroscience yeah. series on his second channel and that had like crazy retention for the time and it being like pure neuroscience stuff i think yeah inducing fun in the conversation with nuance is something very difficult not everybody can do that do that not so not everybody can do it connecting that how how was the episode with tanmay i listened to that like a couple of months ago because I, i think it's been long yeah. since you did it kaisa tha how yeah, did that 2020 go? i think yeah yeah how, how does it feel to speak uh, while speaking to a person who can be incredibly funny at times but also serious mm-hmm. because he's he's fairly respected in the crypto circle right yeah. how, how does it feel yeah. to talk to someone like that so tanmay and i have a very old relationship right uh, i've known him since i was in college and he was in college um Achha. i've literally met tanmay for the first time when he came for my college festival in 2006 if i remember right 2005 2006 um very early on he just started doing stand up um and it, so i've known him since then he was once a contestant on a reality show i was producing so i so i me and tanmay known each other over the years and we meant to do um you know an episode together and just in the middle of the pandemic i said let's just do this week we got to make this happen and but i think the important part is that if you have a naturally entertaining and a naturally um i'd say a, a guest with depth you don't have to try and match that what mm. you all you need to do is just give them like just navigate the conversation um you're just saying okay i know he has all the info i know she has all the info i just need to get all of it out in this one hour so what i'm doing is i think most times i love my questions would be like uh, that's a super interesting point i want to dig into that a lot more uh, what do you think about this addition to that so and then mm. leave it right and, and they then most of these guys they like they like fire they just like go with it um the flip side of that actually i think one of the toughest conversations i had was when i spoke to ronnie scrovala hmm. um ronnie scrovala is super sharp but he's to super to the point so his responses are a full stop like he will give you a response and that's a statement um he doesn't give you something to take ahead hmm. he has given you the final statement right there it gets tough because there you need to make sure you're contributing enough because a there's a lot of weight in what he said but it you just can't finish the episode off in 20 minutes yeah so you got to figure a way to fill the gaps to have more things to ask mm-hmm. um and hopefully find one or two questions where you can actually lead it further but um I think most guests, especially someone like Tanmay, it's very easy to do an episode. I think it's the easiest one um, to do. It's tougher to make it seem like something he hasn't done before, because hmm. anybody who is a somewhat public figure uh, or a creator has had had said so many things online. Mm-hmm. At which point, how do you get them to say something they haven't said before? Like, how do you give them a topic they haven't spoken about before? And that becomes a tough part. So, figuring out the topics you want to pick for them, um, that's the tricky one. man that's see i have i have a very similar experience with that right so i think it was my second or third episode i got warren maya and i was mm. I oh was man like, so super deep yeah i was see what i did was was like very stupid right so i tried to add a point to everything he said sort of an addition mm. I, i thought that keep in the podcast yeah, which is what podcasters should do which is yeah. the basic like in fact like doing that is is perfect because that's exactly what every podcaster should do yeah but i tried to hard <laughs> that's the problem so <laughs> i i ended up saying a couple of stupid things but like after a point like when i got paras chopra i'm not sure if you i'm sure you've heard of it right i've heard of him mm. on twitter yeah, yeah. and that i was just just like a tiny shant student mm. I was listening to everything yeah. he said and this gave him like one question and made him speak for like 5 to 6 minutes on one question and yeah. i think for certain certain cases that works right but it seemed like an interview so the next question for mm. this is how to make sure a podcast doesn't sound like an interview um what you did in, in varun maya's case is how you make it not seem like an interview you have to contribute something as the host mm-hmm. and but you don't have to contribute in every question i feel that that's the gauge is that um at some point are you at least speaking 30% of the time on an average is a good gauge um i'd say the guest speaks about 70% of the time uh of you have and you speak for 30% is a good gauge but in in your head you'll never stick to that exactly but sure. it's basically like your responses cannot be or other your questions shouldn't be longer than their responses hmm. uh, in most cases it happens sometimes i've had guests who have spoken so little that i would say 50% of episode was me talking but that's fine um what you need to just look at the fact that you speaking too much shouldn't make them feel like are they he wanted to talk why did he call me 
right so, yeah um, that's the only line and that only comes from the fact that as long as you're not trying to compete with your guest which happens with a lot of podcast hosts right hmm. oh he said something clever so i'm going to say something more clever than that um that's where you fault because the show is about your guest it's not about you interesting you bring the questions you bring your personality to it uh, the kinds of questions you ask the way you ask it uh, you also dropping your perspective about certain points which they've made is what makes the show yours but it is largely about your guest interesting go what's been your like toughest conversation like other than ronnie screw wala mm my toughest conversation was when i was actually a guest um wow for i think last year's valentines day episode uh, ibm had an interesting idea they said let's get pooja my wife to come on as the host mm-hmm. and she would ask me questions and she refused to tell me what she's going to ask me about um so i said fair enough let's go in with this and i felt that she asked me a bunch of questions i hadn't been asked before um and i think i addressed them well but i think I, that was one of those like i really have to figure out how to say this right because also a person who knows me so well mm-hmm. um and um she didn't put me in the spot but she did tell like, put me I, i was under a bit of pressure to make sure that i i i mm-hmm. performed right on that one yeah i would say that is one but from a host perspective i think the toughest one if i had to really recount and think about um i won't name the episode sure. for a specific reason mm-hmm. but i once forgot i had an episode to record Okay. And five minutes before the recording, I realized there was. I didn't have my research. I had not done my research for that one episode, which actually required a lot of research because it's super technical. Hmm. And um, I spent five minutes going through it. Thankfully, just asked them some pre-chat questions before we hit record on the topic. And I had to wing a super technical episode with zero or almost zero homework. I mean, norm- some if you're doing creator economy, some of those things it's easier to do, right? Yeah. You used to talking about it. but this was like some deep level science stuff in advertising what did so you say i was say? like i just asked more questions huh? um i just stuck to that i went full layman like i'm like is this how it works how did it work is i will explain to me like i'm a child so sometimes i i just played on that it it worked um nobody noticed it mm-hmm. but um i was super ill prepared for that one I I actually did the same thing but I I went to that epi- uh, the, the episode I did with Dinesh Pirate the he's mm. someone who heads investments in Zerada and Rain Matter mm. so I know nothing about the stock market I I know the basics but I I know I know nothing about the stock market because he's Dinesh he knows everything so I went in the podcast ki meko kuch nahi pata and I started from the basics mm. and I think that was more fun right was if I tried mm. saying something ki ha meko ye pata hai this is this the sedition that wouldn't be fun because entering yeah. a conversation like a layman i think that's the most comforting part because it's it's almost like you're in a class it's, it's right? less pressure for you yeah exactly um, like for me advertising is that is about me being a learner I'm, i i believe that like you know you asked me a while back is it performance i feel it's personality hmm. um on advertising is that i am a learner i am playing my audience i'm asking the questions i know my audience wants answers to um so even if i have a little extra knowledge i sometimes hold back from saying it hmm on think fast because it's just the two of us as hosts and giving perspective i give a lot more perspective about what i think uh, something means or what i think something uh what i think something really uh, you know kind of deals with mm-hmm. but and again on 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 take a pause i go a lot slower because i'm like a deep in nuance talking about stuff that's in your mind so it's the personality uh, and and sometimes your personality will shift even from episode to episode basis your guest um hmm. some people are serious you can't get into like a fun mode but I, like i've done an episode with viraj gelani and pulkit kochar right oh, on mm-hmm. on meme marketing and that was one of the fun cuz i think half, i think 25% of the episode we're talking about welcome in a marketing conversation right because hmm. most memers even they don't think of a meme they go watch welcome again for um, sure it is one category of meme creators so i was like okay and you can't help no, have fun with it laugh and be like that but in some cases the super like serious topic you are going to go like you know your tone will go down so i feel it's the personality in many ways for sure right so it's it's like i have like just one returning guest abhi tak and he was mm. like the guest on the second part dipan shuparash he's like almost the same mm. age and i think my personality mm. shifts uh, while i'm talking to someone is let's say closer to my age or like yeah. double or triple my age it's usually that so do you think a personality yeah. changes from language to language it does um mm-hmm. i feel that the way a language is spoken um requires you to change that a little bit um mm-hmm. 
you can't say the same way. Like, uh, you know, I've considered doing take a pause because it's a lot of it is short bites as episodes, which I'm doing um, as uh, a Telugu show, right? Telugu is my mother tongue. I'm like, sure, I just do it in Telugu. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know I'll have to say it differently. I've actually done a, like, I think I did a sample recording once just for my own, like, listening, uh, listening. And I realized the tone was so different and I wasn't sure. But then I went and I went on as a guest on a Telugu podcast. And I realized that's exactly how I spoke there as well. So it's just innately how you speak a language. Like if I do Hindi, it sounds a lot different from how I am normally. But as a normal person, I can mix those two together. It's just about how you put a point across. How do you explain something? Um, and how you explain something in English versus Hindi versus Telugu is going to be so different. Um, that I think it's meant for different audiences. Um, and it will appeal to different audiences in different ways. Yeah, and I think it's, it's also about the topic, right? Let's say you're talking about crypto. Yeah. It will be difficult yeah. to talk about crypto, let's say, in Marathi. I, it's, yeah. I don't know, a couple of Because you're going to use so many defined. terms which are yeah. only going to be English. And yeah. you're going to have to explain that. Um, but that would make a great... But on the flip side, what I feel it also does is it um, it democratizes conversations about the topics hmm. which somehow seem only like they're for English, right? Like, like you said, crypto. Imagine a crypto podcast in... In Marathi or in Telugu or in let's say Canada, for me would suddenly make someone who is not as comfortable with English mm-hmm. learn so much. So what I've always said is that it's as long as you can get the tonality right, as long as you can explain it in a way that is native to that language, mm-hmm. um, you should do it. Um, but if you're just saying, I mean, long back we used to have this um, joke. I, I've worked in television before this, right? So. Sometimes when you have to convert a script from English to Hindi, uh, some people would just do a literal translation. Huh. And that would never make sense. For sure. So what a lot of us would sit down and do is take the literal transition and say, okay, let's make it spoken. Let's make mm. it spoken language. Because how you write something versus how you say it is so different. So oftentimes what you need to really get is, can I explain crypto in Marathi in a way that it's actually spoken? Like would a regular person who speaks Marathi get most of it, except for maybe the technical terms? Sure. As long as you can do that, you should do it. Uh, if it becomes too complex and most of the words you use are non-Marathi words, then it's not technically a Marathi podcast anymore. For sure. Interesting. And yeah. what I want to think about it is when I speak in different languages, my tone changes. Like, I, I my tone goes yeah. higher. Like, my pitch goes like yeah. way higher. Let's see in Marathi and let's see mm-hmm. in Hindi. Because it has emotion involved, right? I don't think exactly. English has that much emotion involved because for the most part, we are all speaking um, in, in like the mother tongue. At least, at least uh, yeah. not professionally. No, I, think I agree. I, I feel, I mean, that's a very important, that's a very valid point because I feel we all learn how to speak our mother tongue, but also I think it's it's what native to you. Like, like I think about my daughter, my daughter's, I think primary language is English in many ways because that's what she's spoken the most. Like she's getting Hindi now, but I think now she speaks Hindi as a second language to English. So for hmm. her, all her excitement, everything else comes out in English. Oh. It doesn't come out, it, it comes out differently in Hindi now. So I, I feel at some point, whatever you're most comfortable with um, should be where you start and where you mm. might have the most energy. But you shouldn't also sound like someone who has learned a language to speak in that, but don't have the highs and lows, like you said. Right? The highs and lows are important. They actually give it effect. They give it that that whole vibe of what that language actually is. Um, which is why I look at some of the Hindi podcasts. I'm like, okay, I would never be able to do that because I don't think I will get that pitch. Sure. Like, look at how a mantra does his podcast. Like, you know, he just gets that whole, he gets that Bhaskar thing from a Bengali side, but he also does like Bhaskar, like how Hindi is. So, um, I feel it's about that. You need to understand how to give the right punch with the language. Interesting. If that's the right way to put it. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting how kids learn the language, right? Like any language. Mm-hmm. So, if you think about it, no one teaches them languages. Like, it's, yeah. it's just like... And I think Peterson spoke something about it, like when, let's say, a parent is teaching, you're a parent now, so you can sort of correct it or comment on this, right? So what he said was when a parent is teaching their kid a language, they make Mm. sure they make it less complex than they would usually do it. So they Mm. get like, so obviously, if if a kid is hearing something for the first time, they'll get it wrong. Yeah. Or partly wrong. So when you start increasing the complexity of a language when talking to a kid, the kid develops complexity too. I think yeah. th- that's what Peterson said, and it's not what he has. I agree. He is, so he read something and he was sort of reiterating that. What do you no, think? I agree it? with that entirely. Mm-hmm. Um, my only uh, add-on to that is, I feel oftentimes we've been taught language from the alphabet and the words, mm-hmm. but if we actually learn the language from the use case, mm-hmm. 
you learn it faster like if someone taught me like i mean not all languages need to be learned from the alphabet upwards in many ways you can actually learn languages from their use like you know you to know what a glass is you know what a table is um you need to like like i've seen that how my daughter learns language is so different from how i learned language like she learns about pronunciation uh from the beginning whereas i think a lot of us did abcd first and eventually came down to pronunciation i'm also like ancient because i'm like almost 40 mm-hmm. but i feel it's also that it's about if you learn how to speak it um rather than write before you learn how to write it you might actually get the language faster because sometimes when you're writing and then speaking i feel it takes a lot longer I and mean, that's my perspective it's not uh science but um like i know that she's learned hindi because of the fact that you know she will hear hindi at home Hmm. and she's picked up a few words and now she says them so cleanly and like exactly how how like a regular person would say it but as when i learned hindi i learned hindi from my textbooks sure but eventually where i learned proper hindi from was bollywood hmm. so i would just watch movies i'm like okay nobody says hey at the end of every hindi sentence but in when sure. you were writing hindi in the textbook everything every sentence ends with a hey i'm like who says hey um and nobody says it so it's I feel there's so many interesting things you can actually kind of go into saying why, what is the way in which you teach. But I feel the more and more I'm seeing how teaching and uh, learning has evolved. So, but how are you going to use it? Um, and as mm-hmm. long as you learn how you're going to use it, it'll just might be faster. Um, which is why you started the simple stuff and add more. But um, and sometimes you maybe don't even need to know how to write something. You just need to know how to speak it. For sure, right? and what i feel is a couple of languages is getting extinct one second, one second. i'm uh, going to get my dog out on sir sure yeah so what i think is like a couple of languages are just getting going to get extinct in a couple of years right mm. and that's mm. a big loss of culture like just think yeah. about it right if you, if you let's say take madushala hindi is never going to get mm. extinct from what i think but let's say yeah. if we ever take madushala as a poem if you convert it in english i'm not sure if that will have the same yeah. you know the same kick that it has when you hear it in hindi and that's a big loss so let's say any language gets extinct the art forms or what the art in the form of that language it's just it's just gone it's weird and, but at some point i feel the interesting part also is i don't think it is going to i feel at some point we moving towards you learned how to write something um because that's the way you could communicate but as we do more and more voice i don't think we will lose it entirely but mm-hmm. I think it'll just be more of a use case scenario, right? How we using it? Hmm. Uh, you rather store it in the archives, but you will still have maybe a small community who still speaks it. For sure. But I feel the more and more just we needed languages to communicate with each other. Um, some will become archived languages because you don't speak them as much, um, or they almost like code language if you were to think about it, right? Some people hmm. only a few people know it, and that's how it works. Um. I hope we don't lose the culture like you, like you just said but I feel it's inevitable in some cases for sure. or it'll just blend into other things blend as in like what do you mean by that um I mean I think about the fact that let's say let's say um how dialects work right um hmm. like I come from a state which has one language is Telugu but you go district by district the way it's spoken is so different um mm-hmm. just the like i come from coastal andhra we stretch our words right each of our mm-hmm. words are stretched the syllables are stretched you go more towards the center and you people speak much faster some of the words we use are slightly different from how let's say in other parts of the state are so it's not just languages it's dialects i feel what we'll lose first are dialects Mm-hmm. which might either blend into like you know eventually everybody might just speak the language in the same way for sure or some of those dialects will go away and then maybe languages will go unless it's a super like i don't know if there's something called a niche language but i think this the community size is what will uh, affect things um but uh, yeah i mean it's it's, it's a, languages are super interesting like um, i haven't dug deep enough into it but um would be interesting to see how that evolves especially when we stop typing at some point yeah i hope that doesn't happen because writing is awesome um mm-hmm. but at some point you might just stop writing and like i said typing instead of writing right at some point you were just going to type instead of writing and then eventually not even type anymore um yeah. when it comes to that how do you make sure some parts of just the calligraphy how it's written all that stays man what do you think about the hive mind let's say hive mind is, is some sort of an example where we are not typing we are not writing 
it's mm. an entire mind uh, you know what i meant yeah. for sure so yeah, yeah, yeah. what do you think about that how how do you think will that work so usme you can literally just download anyone's experience and mm. make it your own and after point it's not even that that person's experience because it's it's one mind collective so, i'm i'm not sold on the concept entirely because i feel that we'll always um our experience is our experience because we look at the world a certain way like you know each of us look at the world a certain way basis how our experiences till that point have been hmm. um it's like how i look at let's say randomly a color mm-hmm. and versus how you look at color you remember something basis that color like if if i look at a blue i'll remember something else from what you might remember sure. because that's what your experiences have been about when you're sharing experiences i don't know how that would fit into it because others you'll end up just all seeing the same thing we'll all have mm-hmm. the same experiences which i feel will make us lose a key aspect of being human because For if sure. you're truly human because it's your experiences how you've seen it how you seen it as a kid and how that mm-hmm. evolves and how you see it when you grow up and how that changes within your mind um my biggest question mark on the hive mind is that is that how do you take care of that individual individual individualism in that mm-hmm. sense um how do you kind of evolve from that point um and not just make it all common because if it's all common then we're all the same and that's just boring right yeah no and if you think about it the only thing distinguish one person from another is the way they interpret a sentence like whatever it be a yeah. sentence or whatever so what i think is it won't ever happen like as a high mind because for that to happen yeah. you, have, you need to have a tyranny established because you want everybody to then we're all like, then we're all like uh, cyb- we're all like we're all machines then right? yeah simple thing like you're taking one like it's like a file which is in our computer versus a, the same file in another computer is pretty much seeing it the same way unless the data set or the program which built on is different um but like if if you feed a certain level of data into one program and the same program exists on a different computer if they'll both interpret it the same way yeah but we all have different softwares technically i mean our operating systems might be the same but our softwares are very different like we yeah. someone's on like a newer version someone's on older version someone's on like a hacked version in that sense um so i feel that interpretation is key to being human For sure. um and if you take that away then i mean i don't know if you if the matrix that's the one big thing i think about the matrix like could you plug in and make someone teach someone a skill yes but could teach someone nuance maybe not well probably right we could still do it right because just it's just a read or write thing after a point if we yeah. having the hive mind we just putting a chip inside the brain we just uh, that will that will ruin all the fun what do you think about uploading yeah. a consciousness to the computer do you think do you want to stay alive uh, in let's say a computer format yes. want to do it um i wouldn't want to stay alive in a computer format do i believe that if somebody said i want to put a part machine chip in you and you would live longer and stay healthy i would definitely consider it um uh, i feel the point of immortality or just like sticking on is that is the experience going to be better or are you just sticking around because you want to stick around is the question um in many cases it might make more sense to not say i maybe a a, a an infinite sense might not be a good thing um this is super interesting book which i love is i've actually read it a couple of times it's called uh, 4000 weeks hmm. right um it basically um, it's a, yeah it's right yeah. um it's by author called oliver berkman and and he says that the average human life is 4000 weeks so it is hmm. right you live average is about 75 80 years yeah so 4000 weeks so, and suddenly that feels much smaller right it doesn't feel like that long yeah but because it's 4000 weeks you suddenly look at your life a certain way you live it a certain way you look at what you spend it on um in a way if it was infinite would you really care about what you spent your time on as much would you value it as much is the question hmm. um as long as the extension like i said gives you a better experience if it makes you okay this is unfinished work i want to finish mm-hmm. this is unfinished life i want to live longer but i can live it in a way where i'm not um just like a part of a machine yeah. or i'm not just like part of this thing then um i feel that's it um i i would look It'd at that saddening way. after a point right just to live after a point yeah, it yeah, makes yeah, sense not everything has to last forever for um, sure but is there a way that you can share your knowledge from your mind and put it in a database so somebody else can use it tomorrow maybe That'd some parts of it but you know can you segment that out Yeah, so something like because we don't necessarily yeah. want to put everything we ever thought of on public record hmm, uh true. might be a bad idea for every single person or other right so 
um how do you do that becomes then the the point for sure it would be fun to have let's say a jack or like a peterson uh what about computer type situation when you ask a question to that computer they give down yeah. it's not necessarily them speaking but it's the way they talk speak i mean something like that yeah yeah okay so let's circle back to podcast right i have a very yeah. weird observation so what i've mm. seen is most popular podcasts the, the, the hosts mm. aren't like pure podcast creators they are usually like yeah. let's say rogan is a comedian uh, tim ferris mm. he's an entrepreneur he's an yeah. investor and whatnot let's see you you're not just a podcaster yeah why do you think that is i have, I have, I have a hypothesis on that which is like a person can only speak valuable stuff on a podcast if and only if they have had certain experience in the real world or else it's just normal conversation or normal day to day conversation that's what i think what do you think about that um yes and no mm-hmm. yes is that you know each of us comes from um it's easier for you to get credibility with an audience if you've done something in the space you're talking about right um and so i would say this the topic of your podcast in many ways comes from what you've done in the past like i only did take a pause on mindset building and personality development way after i had done advertising is dead because i moved my credibility as an entrepreneur to advertising is dead hmm. built enough credibility as a podcaster before starting a podcast i didn't actually have enough knowledge on like i i i, I what i share over there is not that i know so much about mindset building i'm sharing that this is what i am learning and i'm just sharing what i'm learning with you but let's say if someone in in college or like if you're doing a podcast you're coming into this thing this is my curiosity i'm coming from the perspective of someone my age with my experience um that's fine too as long as you're coming in saying my experience is is where i starting from um it's fine because that's where your audience also connects to right okay one second I, i'm also like around the same age i also have similar thoughts i want to hear this conversation to figure out it's almost like my voice is asking the questions hmm. for your audience and i think that's the layer you need to give the lesson what is unique about my show is always going to be the host what is unique about me in terms of my perspective is what you bring to the table so a rogan's perspective is always going to be that irreverent comedian who's asking questions which is going to piss half the world off sure. right but on the other end if you look at someone like a like an amit verma right or arguably the best pod, conversationalist podcaster we have in our country mm-hmm. amit is like a super research journalistic voice right he's this very accomplished journalist who can talk about like everything from socio political stuff to psychology to economics but go super deep into them i mean his show notes are like a treasure because every episode mm. show notes and links you can go to is itself like going to take you like a week if not more longer to go through and and he comes from that background so he's doing research but if you talk about a podcast which is just so randomly irreverent like i'm trying to think of the most irreverent one i hear um i think of uh, there's there's one i've heard a few episodes of which i think is called new kids on the block which ivm does which is just a bunch of kids talking about being kids mm-hmm. and their life and how they look at the world but again it's how they look at the world and as a kids i think sure. they're not even they're younger than you mm-hmm. i won't call you a a kid because you're old you're yeah, you you're, 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 you're cross that yeah. you cross that barrier now you cross sure. that barrier yeah sure um but it's just that you need to play from your strong point mm-hmm. of saying this is my experience hence my voice comes from this versus if i was tomorrow to go on to a medical podcast and claim to be someone who knows about medicine that's never going to fly yeah and I, you're going to get called out sooner or later saying once like what do you know about this um and that's where you kind of come in and say okay just because i grew up in a family of doctors does not mean i know enough about medicine this, this interesting would you still do the podcast if you have like no audience like just just zero audiences no one's listening to it mm i asked this question to venamra i'm not sure if you know of, about him i know venamra yeah yeah you know ha say to usko kuch aata hai he used to wait he he was at ibm yeah, briefly yeah. when i was when i started off my show so i remember him that time and we've chatted a few times um not all my podcasts i would do take a pause even if i didn't have an audience because i do it for a very specific reason it's it's a channel for me to share what i'm learning um it helps me channelize my thoughts you know it's literally it's one of those processes i go through um the business ones i'm not so sure i think advertising is doing think fast are what they are because of the audience um it's hmm. they evolved because of the audience right? someone listens to an episode okay mm. 
I'd want more of this or I know why aren't you talking about that yet and I've evolved the show over the years because of that. I don't think that would evolve as much. I think every podcast needs an audience to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um but the only show which I might still do if I didn't have an audience uh would be take a pause. Interesting. For me I'd do the podcast if I don't have an audience and I have yeah. a reason for that, right? Cuz I'm getting like interesting people on the show and I won't get them any which ways at this age it's really difficult for me to get a job and sort of get in touch with them whereas podcasting for me it's kind of the easiest way to do it so I think it works for me yeah. but yeah still for sure right for most podcasts they develop the way the audience is right if the audience is dropping off at x point you have to make sure that you're not saying that stuff over and over again okay so what have you learned about podcasting let's say the podca- Indian podcasting audience like something very mm. peculiar peculiar learning about the Indian podcast audience um I think that Indian podcasting audience really likes um I put this way there is I feel we just beginning to understand what the Indian podcasting audience is I don't mm-hmm. think they necessarily care about something just being audio or just being video or what the format differences are they want content that is not talking over them but is talking to them something they can really understand um if you look which is why nuance is something which is a lot trickier in india yet there are some which go super nuanced and it works but i feel largely a lot of our podcasts still need to talk to someone who's saying okay i i want to learn more i want to know more and i, I like that part about the audience um i feel the big part of our audience is is lying in non english um mm. i feel the largest part of the indian podcasting audience will be in hindi will be in regional languages and i feel that's now getting tapped into but i feel that's super under tapped but um my biggest learning has been that i always considered audio and video separate hmm. um as saying you know something works in audio doesn't have to be in video um and i come from a video background but um, i feel that it's it's such an interesting combination of uh, of putting both out and realizing they're two very different audiences but yet are also the same audience um people like to consume it in different ways um and that's been my learning um saying there's anything diff- i don't think there's anything innately different about the indian audience mm-hmm. um except i don't think they listen to as many 3 hour long episodes as the west does for sure may but uh, but amit verma has a fabulous audience so he does 2 3 hour he's done a 5 hour episode um so um there is and he has a solid audience so i don't know i think we're still very early to understand mm-hmm. it we have definitely gone beyond radio audience we've definitely sure. now come to a point where podcasts are getting more and more mainstream you have brands want to invest into it which means that they are mainstream but people want more than just conversations uh people want direct so um if you're just talking to them on your mic and not even having a chat episode that might actually do really well compared to a chat episode you might just give them like mm. a 5 minute audio blog and that might do really well compared to a highly edited piece so it's not about the it's it's not about the content being longer in in that sense it's about saying how directly are you giving it to someone um and are they getting bang for their buck from like minute 1 um is where i think a lot of it is coming from um, again these are like a random set of learnings i've had because i think the overall the audio consumer is the same globally um mm-hmm. but i feel these are more indian ones which i've at least realized okay how how did ivm happen like how is how is it like working with a podcasting company are there like mm. sort of restrictions that you have to keep in mind while recording a podcast so i've been with them now for a good like what 3 2018 and 2 4 years now um they aren't really any restrictions per se okay. uh, in the sense that obviously the, the podcast is distributed and monetized by them um mm. the producer comes from their end the sound engineering mastering this all of that happens from their end my job is to bring myself and help curate the guests um that's how it works um but it's been great to see because i've seen ivm obviously from the time i joined when they were still reasonably smaller to now being an entire scaled organization with like solid sales team all that stuff happening like a literally like two floor office now in in bombay and what's been great is to to have someone to bounce stuff off mm-hmm. uh someone to give you broader perspective beyond just your show hmm. um that's been super valuable um So that's actually been getting IBM actually happened to me because there's a show called the Filter Coffee podcast with Karthik Nagarajan. Mm. Um Karthik was recording his pilot and asked me to be his guest for his pilot because the pilot wasn't going to go live. I finished that came out so I chatting with Amit who's the founder at IBM and later on came as a guest on another show of theirs and we got mm-hmm. chatting again and that's how everything is that happened. Like my deal with them happened literally 
um, post that. And uh, what I've actually learned from them is I can constantly sit with them and also understand where the market's going, how the data is working. Um, also, uh, understanding what formats are working beyond mine. Right? We can mm-hmm. talk about okay, what are the shows are doing well. I want to understand what do they. Who can I collab with? Like sometimes you end up bringing another podcast guest on. You're part of a network, so you play mm-hmm. on that uh, as well. Um, so it it all not really helps to have someone like that who knows how to do this, and also like the fact that you don't have to master it, don't have to distribute it yourself is For like sure. great because my job ends after I stop recording. Mm-hmm. Um, after that, it's on them. Um, so that's been great. Which is why my, literally two of my shows, both Think Fast and Advertising, is did both with uh, IBM. Um, they produce it. Only, only, only take a pause I do by myself. Interesting. So what is it about podcasts that you dislike? You want to change about the podcasting, whatever industry you're seeing? Um, discovery. Um, I feel hmm. we still haven't figured out how to make discovery easier. I mean, we did, I don't think we need to rethink the wheel. We just need to understand like how you would search for something on YouTube. This is how you have to try and search something on on even a Spotify, which has gotten much better now, is so different, right? Um, I okay. think the big thing is, while we're trying to solve for monetization, I feel what we all need to solve for is discovery. Um, how do the algos throw up the right uh, podcast people to listen to? How do you make sure a, a new podcast still gets listenership? Um, that's the key thing that needs to be changed. Um, monetization, I think, will happen the old school way. You will eventually scale to having enough ads there. Um We'll have programmatic ads come in, which I think is what is needed for yeah. most podcasters. Is basically like, you know, go like, can can you monetize? Like you spoke about Tanmay episode, right? Mm-hmm. Now the Tanmay episode for me came out in 2020. Um, I can't monetize that episode right now because my ads are built into the audio file that was uploaded. Hmm. So till programmatic comes in, whenever when IBM is bringing it on, hopefully I, I know they are bringing it on sometime soon. Um, that's when they can sell even that episode with an ad. So I can make money off an older episode versus now I can only make mon- money on what I'm releasing now or will release tomorrow. So once that changes, you'll make money like how YouTubers make money. Um, so I sure. think that two things, bringing programmatic at scale across the world. But I think the biggest problem is discoverability. Uh, we haven't figured out discoverability on audio. Interesting. Let's just jump to your book, right? So hmm. what's your book about? Let's let's start from the scratch. Beginning yeah. say, kya scene? So... My book's called Everything is Out of Syllabus. Um, the idea was simply um, from, it came from a, deep, a basic insight which I had that there are, I'm almost 40 now and between the ages of 18 and 24, I, I was a very confused person. I had a lot of stuff which I hadn't figured out, really struggled with. And I said, what would me as an almost 40 year old try to tell me at 18 and 20? Um, and I realized that there are a bunch of things in our lives that we never really taught we only learn as we go along uh, we never taught how to start things we never taught how to make choices we never taught how to learn we never taught how to make connections with other people build relationships and we never taught how to reflect within ourselves um, and I basically the book is a distillation of these five things into smaller chapters now uh, it's an easy read you can literally go from chapter to chapter don't go any flow you want it's not just me giving any form of learnings from my own life. It's also a bunch of stuff I've learned from um, a lot of really smart people from across the world, right? Um, mm-hmm. So it's just distilled down to that. So it's a way for anybody to sit down and say, if there was ever a rule book for my life, how would I build it? I would build it across these primary tenants. And um, yeah, the, the book kind of happened also because, I mean, I was I got connected to someone from Penguin and they said, mm-hmm. do you want to write a book? And I said, I want to write a book called at that point in time, the title was longer. It was basically going to be uh, work is crossed off, life is crossed off, um, relationships are crossed off, all of that. And then say eventually everything is out of syllabus. Achha. So hmm. we realized that it was too long. We even did a title. I remember we did a title design with all of that and we realized that didn't make sense. So um, I said, okay. And they said, let's write it. Um, I started writing it in March 2020, mm-hmm. 2021. Finished it by October 2021 and it came out this Feb. Interesting. How's it doing like book book events, like book promotion events? Are they fun or are they like just a formality now that oh, you have to I do? Oh, I really like it. Um, you like so it? Um, I've not done too many. I did a lot of few virtual ones. I've done two in-person ones. Plan to do a lot more in-person once colleges and stuff open up um, okay. end of May, June onwards. Um, but whatever I've done, I mean, as long, I've just kept it simple, have a lot more audience interaction. Like I, I did one in Delhi, which I think went on for three hours because the oh, wow. everybody was there was just chatting, right? We were just hmm. like, just jamming on, on questions everybody had. 
Um, so as long as you keep it that way, it's great fun to do because you get to kind of talk to people about like how we are talking, right? Just have nuanced conversation, talk about specific points from the book, um, or someone who kind of popped in and just want to speak about it. And I remember my daily event fondly because I, the youngest person I think was sixteen, the oldest was sixty-five. Oh my god! Um, mm. So nice range of people kind of coming in and you're having those conversations and. And end of the day, what you're talking about is life. Um, you know, you're talking about life. You're talking about um, how to deal with work and how to deal with relationships, and how to deal with learning things which you're interested in. And um, what I've continued to do is just really talk about the specific points in the book, which I think will give people value. Mm-hmm. And um, from whatever I have read and consumed from authors, putting a book out might actually be the easy part. Um, continuing to talk about it is like a lifelong thing. you will talk about this book for life you will even if you write more books you will continue to speak about your books for life um sure. and um, because also like you do distill down so much learning onto into one like literally like books lying around somewhere here mm-hmm. one tiny uh, book there and um, i feel in in many ways it's actually been one of the most creatively enriching uh, processes i've been through interesting did you like memorize an entire like pitch script like before every event which you said or did you just wing every event no nothing i, I oh, just wow. go in and say so um i, I both events i had uh, people who were moderators who just asked me questions about the book mm-hmm. but i largely remember what i wrote about in the book so i don't necessarily have to go back and refer um to it um specific parts i might forget um because mm-hmm. i sometimes you write it you tend to forget the the base line of what you wrote but at a broad level i know what i've written about across all the chapters so it is more about am i answering this in a way that it also evolves right i feel the more and more you speak to authors you realize that what you've written is never especially non fiction um never a, f- a full stop um For it sure. evolves i mean you go back to even like the 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 what is that the 10000 hour rule Mm-hmm. which uh, i think came out with malcolm gladwell's i think was it outliers i think outliers uh, yeah um, and he was one of the first people to kind of put it out there mm-hmm. um he till date says that even though it was one of his biggest hits as a book he said like that one thing has evolved he doesn't believe in that anymore um mm-hmm. he actually believes that it's far more nuanced than just saying 10000 hours and you've mastered it um you got to look at it slightly differently from that sense so Yeah, I, I feel uh, even what you put down on paper will evolve. Uh, hmm. What you need to have is an engaged conversation with your audience. Interesting. Why a book, though? You are a podcaster. Why? What is it about writing a book, which an audio format in which you are speaking can't deliver? Hmm. I feel a book. If you look at, I mean, I've worked across all mediums now. Hmm. Um, I worked in television. I worked in digital content. Um, I've worked in um, podcasting. I feel a book. is one of the most um it's such a singular activity it's not you know every other piece you are kind of working with someone you're dealing with an audience while building it this you know it is the legs to it mm. a book is you sitting in a room writing for months and if not years and it's all on you um you got to figure out how it flows so as a creative endeavor there is i haven't had an experience quite like it um i started off writing a book saying okay i always want to write a book i want to see how it feels like but once i've written one book i know that it's i mean i mean it's a whole different feeling altogether i mean okay. there's something to it which i'm i don't know how to explain but more than nickels it's it's i feel the purest form of content creation for sure uh, if you do it right i mean if you're doing it like okay this is what i'm writing putting it down work with an editor to kind of help you like, fill the gaps in terms of um see this wasn't clear or this needs more explaining or maybe this shouldn't be there but um compared to all other mediums which feel like they're more evolving beasts mm-hmm. um i feel the traditional ones like say books or even cinema in that sense um in different ways are almost those you spent so much time creating them mm-hmm. versus everything else feels like you're just creating always right yeah. i mean I, i wrote this book in like 7 8 months mm-hmm. uh, i know people who've written books for 2 years um and it's a process you you make it a part of your day you your finish line is far away but you're just doing it and there's a process that on a daily basis without that pay off ever being a part of what you're thinking of you're just working on it versus i feel with every other medium you're thinking of the pay off a lot sooner For sure. like okay i've recorded the podcast it'll come out next week it'll come out two weeks later yeah. um book i'm like what seven eight months later it's going to come out and even after it comes out i'm still like figuring out like how to evolve it i have to do the audiobook now so i'm like 
sitting and planning how to uh, do the audio book and you'll be speaking and... for that like your voice yeah yeah i'm oh. doing i'm doing the voice yeah man i think something about books and let's say even cinema right that that form of expression let's say person is listening to it or reading it it's or watching it it's not like a podcast where you can just switch on the podcast and start working right yeah. because most of people while listening to podcast they either driving or like whatever they are working on something whereas at least in cinema and books you can't do that because like books mein to it's impossible to read whereas let's say if it's an audio book i think it, it's sort of in the middle like book ke beech mein uh, podcast ke beech mein when i agree it's deeply involved um um from the creation standpoint even before you get into the creation um hmm. like, and and the thing with cinema also and books right you might spend 10 years of your life doing something and it might just end up getting like bad reviews and no one reads it mm-hmm. but i feel the pay off you of you actually doing it um it's going to far um out the way how the results might be in most cases i don't think in all cases um you'll obviously mm-hmm. want it to do well let's be honest mm-hmm. but like i think like what atomic habits james clear wrote it over 3 4 years he took to write the book um mm-hmm. in bits and pieces because if you're either doing a job or doing something else you're taking time out like i would like write early mornings or sometimes on in afternoons when i had an extra couple of hours um over the span of the 7 8 months um, and i know that's how people write they write late night or early morning try to take a weekend and go do that i took like one week off work to literally hit my deadlines because i really missed out um oh. i missed a bunch of deadlines but um, yeah it's it's the process is super enriching um you're not thinking about pay off you're not even thinking about data none of those things which you used to modern content creation mm-hmm. like this is it's 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 super pure awesome we're in the last segment of the podcast cuz it's already 6 and uh, am i like sort that's of good. coming in between of a couple that's of good, minutes that's good. i i have a few things to finish but it's not it's not a call so i can i can go on acha badhiya yeah, scene okay so what do you think about the indian content space what is it about the indian content space that you dislike ah uh, what do i dislike about the indian content space um i feel the more and more it evolves so often times we try to make it more of the same Hmm. and i'm saying this because we've come from the time of television to now digital content um but i feel many of the larger formats of of content is still pretty much the same like we don't um i i know there have been people like let's say a, a tvf or you know pocket aces and some of these others who really evolved how narrative happens on fiction for instance right mm-hmm. um but has your mass level content evolved more apart from a bunch which i'm super excited about like you know, when when scam 92 came out i'm like that's like awesome. it's, it's it's an evolved piece of content mm-hmm. but you have so much of the same stuff it's just like repackaged redone i feel that's what um i feel th- there is a revolution coming there is already happening um but in my head it should should happen sooner yes mm-hmm. but on the other end of the spectrum i feel what's also happened is a lot of the digital content which you saw with social content especially in youtube um bringing out different kinds of voices because you're seeing something works and it's not an indian problem it's a global problem ha huh. okay let me follow that format like let me do okay everyone's making reels this way and i have i've fallen prey to that as much as anybody else did right? someone making reels this way let's make reels like that um someone's getting these kind of guests on your podcast let's get these kind of guests on your podcast are we doing enough to give people variety that they can actually oh my god i didn't know that this was something i could i would want to consume it's riskier but mm-hmm. i feel in the long term that might actually be less risky than doing what everybody else is doing anyway but um, i feel that that comes from just basic risk aversion right you want to do more of what's worked and um, that's what i've always disliked i mean i've disliked that since i started off in content way mm-hmm. back in television um is that we still worry way too much in experimenting um and that's happening in youtube now which i'm seeing and i'm like don't make all youtube all instagram people doing the same thing everyone has the same kind of twitter threads everybody will have the same kind of reel formats um how do you make sure that's different like i've fallen into a trap so many times and then i suddenly one day look at my feed and think why am i doing videos like everybody else why am i not talking about something which i which i should talk about and I give myself a smack on the back of my head and like let's let's figure something out right um I feel yeah. more of us need to do that to ourselves as content creators yeah, it's 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 saddening right if you think about it any popular content piece on let's say youtube you can just put them in a box like let's say four boxes yeah. you name a box yeah. for a specific it's like a similar archetype they have for producing content yeah. it works and they're making money in which way it also comes to the platform i yeah, forget for, it right for thumbnails today are more important than the content on youtube because the thumbnail mm-hmm. decides how the content does um i feel it's also on that but 
इट्स ऑल्सो अबाउट जस्ट पीपल प्लेइंग सेफ पीपल गोइंग बाई ओके दिस ये चलता है इज द बिगेस्ट प्रॉब्लम इन द वर्ल्ड दिस इज वर्किंग लेट्स नॉट वाई डू हैव चेंज इट बट only when you change it do you realize if something different can also work for sure and right. from time to time some people try and that changes like i think what like even like talk about mass content right i'm talking about like shark tank india hmm. i knew so many people who said it not work in india because people have tried and failed yeah yeah this worked so well mm-hmm. why it worked is they made one innate change i don't know if you know there were actually been two other versions of shark tank in india before the shark tank know. happened mm-hmm. there were two biz- i think one or two business channels who did versions of it there's called some i think it was called the pitch if i remember right uh, way back a business channel did it hmm. super okay. serious very on point most technical terms damn boring sure right here they said one second my audience is not the people who already know about vc funding hmm. my audience is that person who has no idea about this world how do i kind of normalize and democratize this whole conversation so they stuck to that they chose right uh in terms of the sharks they got on but they made it deeply entertaining in a way that i think all of us eventually watched and you sometimes don't even have to rethink the wheel you just have to make sure that you don't stick to saying okay this is what has worked in the us let me do the exact same thing like if even if you watch like what dragons den uh which is the uk version so the original show of shark tank is called dragons den if i remember the name right this is a uk show um and they brought it to the us it became shark tank hmm and those two shows are the uk one is super boring very serious <laughs> it's like so drab and very serious it's got a lot of the same masala Achha. but it's just like it's very britishly like cold right Haan. the lighting Achha. is very cold even seeing the dungeon kind of a thing but the american one is obviously very flashy the same way. Sure. so you need to bring in your cultural nuance in but you need to rethink the format for your audience um in the right way and i feel like now that shark tanks work you know they want to 50 other shows on similar lines that people will want to pitch yeah for sure for sure right next next big content creator or like uh, agla youtuber con you will have all of that stuff coming up right um that is the one trap you all fall into like more of the same will come and then eventually one more shark tank kind of thing will happen and then now we will want to do that for sure um I but you can't help it, ourselves um, yeah i think like when a content piece is successful at least in india the way to sort of figure it out it's memes if there are memes about that yeah. specific content piece it means they yeah, these guys have nailed it cuz see it's, it's a weird thing about memes right cuz it's how do you define a meme there's no clear definition Le- okay let's try defining a meme what do you, what do you, what do you mean by a meme well, I, i i think a meme is um expressing an innate human emotion through pop culture interesting interesting but because it's, it's, yeah. if you look at any meme which you relate to it's it's so universal in what you're feeling mm-hmm. even if you haven't watched the show like i think i saw the aman meme before i saw the episode where he said it ha huh, huh. from shark tank because you mentioned shark tank just now um and because and it but it actually made sense to me right um you get the vibe to at least 50% of the case and then you see the actual content you get 100% of it but it needs to be uh, almost like a general emotion that anybody can feel if it's too niche then i think memes don't work as well if it's very like universal in when you see it you know what it's about and you laugh um and you taking that piece out of pop culture then that's i mean that's for me a meme yeah and the thing about memes is memes are so accessible and despite the fact that they are so layered right if you think about it a meme has so much context behind it and it's not like a very normal joke right a, no- a normal joke can just have a setup and a punchline whereas even as the most simpler meme it has so many layers and that's what you, no one can create that like sort of artificially so what i'm trying to say is let's say a couple of companies have actually tried the meme advertising mm-hmm. format you might obviously know about it why yeah. do you think that's not work um doing just meme advertising won't work cuz it will always be something you do in parts it's never the whole of advertising the whole okay. of advertising will also be so pop culture is you connecting to culture which is basically what's happening right now your topical but when you look at broader strategy that's a lot more that, that's the non meme kind of work it's they're talking about long term what are the brand stand for what's the voice all that stuff so um this will always be a part of the mix it can't be the entire mix because hmm. and even like before right, you would have pop culture references you would do all of that stuff even before memes became a thing in advertising but you still had to do other stuff 
So I think the problem is that as meme companies have had to grow and evolve, um, they've also realized this is a part of what they do. It's not the whole. Interesting. Have you like worked with brands in terms of memes, sort of um, an anecdote from that? Have we done that? So we've actually worked with Netflix for the longest time since they came to India as an agency. Uh, mm-hmm. We worked with a bunch of uh, mothers. I mean, we've we've done some. Uh, we've done a lot of work for them. So obviously, meme was a strong part of how that because we literally would put out pop culture to make sure that people would make that into um, stuff that they would share. Um, I mean, that's the first thing that comes to mind. But um, and we would have a team who works on that, who kind of evolves that. But over time, I've actually seen that it helps to have people with that unique skill set as part of the team. Mm-hmm. Because they can pick up that topicality, put it out there, and the best people to hire for that are people who make just memes online themselves. Sure. Uh, hire someone who does memes mm-hmm. for fun, make this part of their job, and and also give them a certain level of freedom, and also make sure the client gives them that level of freedom uh, to be able to really do what they do best, and uh, then they, they do all the magic. I think I think one of the best companies that I've sort of tried doing it or I have done it is Zomato. Like if you check Zomato Twitter, yeah, yeah. it's yeah, and crazy as, and it works. Because right? Akshar, Akshar Patak, right? Akshar yeah, Patak has been working there for a long yeah. time and Akshar has been doing that really well. Um, again, it depends on that person. Um, it's, it depends on the person who's doing it. Could be the group of people who are doing it. They need to be have that whole, um, they need to have that tap on culture. They need to have that tap on how to make something into a meme, hmm. which I feel is not a, something you can teach, but something you can innately just come from you. Interesting. Awesome. So, last question from the podcast. I'm turning 18 next year. Okay. Hmm. What do you want to say to me? Nothing. I feel that if you're turning 18 next year, then um, you are in no rush to have to do everything before you're 19. Um, I feel the biggest problem with the world we live in is that you're told everything has to happen now. That you need to achieve everything. You need to do everything right now. You can't wait for tomorrow. But I feel that as much as you might believe life is short life is long and you need to soak in and ha- make sure every experience you have is something you actually like enjoy hmm. and not just something you rush through so I've literally my, my advice to anyone who's like 18 and below or even like 20 21 is that don't just rush through it and say okay I'm coming towards like one target and I want to move towards it I'm not enjoying every experience I have today because this period between your time you're 19 and Actually, even 30 is a very unique period of experiences. Um, you experience so much about how the broader world works. You get to experience, um, even experiment about where your career and life might go. Um, and then the 30s happen and 30s is when you kind of stabilize a little bit, right? Um, and then you get to my part of the of the stick, which is 40, where I'm still figuring out what that means. Um, but um, I would say that you don't have to rush to do everything right now. Um, but make sure whatever you're doing, you're giving yourself the opportunity to experiment hmm. um, and and not say, okay, this is what I'm doing. So I'm going to work on that. But don't put yourself in a box. Try out different things. You never know what comes your way um, and what you actually find to be, okay, this is what I'm going to do for a large part of my life. And then that might change in three years. Um, and, and that's how things evolve. For sure. Thank you so much, man. It's been great talking to you. Uh, guys- Likewise. All the links for Varun will be in the description down below. You can check those out. Until the next episode. Bye-bye. I'll stop the...